There is a party at the Conways this autumn evening of 1919, but we cannot see it, only hear it. All we can see at first is the light from the hall coming through the curtained archway on the right of the room and a little red firelight on the other side. But we can hear young voices chattering and laughing and singing the sharp little explosion of a cracker or two. It is all very jolly indeed. Then we hear a girl's voice calling loud and clear. The voice that replies farther off can only be Mrs. Conway's and she says... To this, Hazel, who is obviously very excited, calls... Yes, yes, marvellous! ...and then calls to somebody yet farther away, probably upstairs... Carol, in the back room! ...and now Hazel dashes in, switching on the light. We see at once that she is a tall, golden young creature dressed in her best for this party. She is carrying an armful of old clothes, hats and odds and ends, all the things that happy people used to dress up in for charades. The room looks very cosy. The curtains are drawn. On the left is a fireplace or an anthracite stove glowing red. It is one of those nondescript rooms used by the family far more than the drawing room is and variously called the back room, the morning room, the school room, the nursery, the blue, brown or red room. This might easily have been called the red room for in this light it seems to range from pink to plum colour and it makes a fine cosy setting for the girls in their party dress. Another one has arrived while Hazel is dumping her charade things on a round settee in the middle of the room. This is Carol, the youngest of the Conways, perhaps 16, and now terrifically excited, breathless and almost tottering beneath a load of charade stuff, including a cigar box gloriously filled with old false whiskers and noses, spectacles and whatnot. With all the false whiskers and things in? Oh, I knew it had been thrown away! With all the reckless haste of a child, she bangs down all this stuff, and now, after adding that Carol is an enchanting young person, we can leave them to explain themselves. Look! Oh, don't snatch! Well, I must look too, mustn't I, idiot? <laughs> oh, Bagside, this one! Oh, Carol and this moustache! All oh, right, but don't take all the good ones, <laughs> Hazel. Kay and Madge will want some. I think Kay ought to have first choice. After all, it's her birthday, and you know how she adores charades. <laughs> Mother won't want any of these because she'd rather look grand, wouldn't she? <laughs> Spanish or Russian or something. <laughs> what are you doing? Good morning, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pennyman, you know Hazel at the paper shop. The one who hates Lloyd George and wags his head very slowly all the time he tells you Lloyd George is no good. <laughs> Do you, Mr. Pennyman, Hazel, go on. <laughs> no, I couldn't, Carol. I've only seen him about twice. I never go to the paper shop. <laughs> Alan, come in. <laughs> Don't let the others see. Isn't she exactly like Mr. Pennyman at the paper shop? <laughs> the one who hates Lloyd George? <laughs> she is a bit. I hate Lloyd George. <laughs> no, he doesn't talk like that, oh. Hazel. <laughs> Not the least little bit. He says, I'll tell you what it is, Miss Conway. That there Lloyd George, they're going to be sorry they ever put him where they did, she. <laughs> yeah, yes, that, that's him. Very good, Carol. <laughs> I think I ought to be an actress. They said at school I was the best Shylock they ever had. <sighs> You can have the moustache if you like, Carol. Are you sure you don't want it? I don't think you ought to dress up as a silly man because you're so pretty. Perhaps I could wear these and do Mr Pennyman. Couldn't we bring him into the third syllable somehow instead of a general? I think we've had enough generals. Mm, yeah, we have. Ask Kay to work in Mr Pennyman instead. Well, Kay ought to be here now, planning everything. Uh, she's coming in. Mother told me to tell you not to make too much of a mess in here. Oh, you must have a mess with charades. <laughs> part of it. And just wait till Mother starts dressing up. She makes more mess than anybody. <laughs> oh, I hope some of the old ones are going now, are they? Yes, I think so. Oh, it's much more fun without them. And Mother daren't let herself go while they're still here. Oh, tell Kay and Matt to come in, Alan. Uh, right. <sighs> <laughs> Could you believe that people ever wore such ridiculous things? I can just remember Mother in that, can't you? Uh, of course I can, infant. <sighs> that was Daddy's coat, wasn't it? Yes. I believe he wore it that very holiday. Perhaps we ought to put it away. Oh, I don't think Mother would mind now. Yes, she would. And I know I would. I don't want anybody to dress up and be funny in the coat father wore just before he was drowned. Come 
wonder if it's very horrible being drowned. Oh, don't start that all over again, Carol. Don't you remember how you used to go on asking that until Mother was furious? Yes, but I was only a kid then. Well, now that you think you aren't a kid any longer, just stop it. It was the coat that made me remember. You see, Hazel, to be talking and laughing and all jolly, just the same as usual, and then only half an hour afterwards, to be drowned. It's so horrible. It seemed awfully quick to us, but perhaps to him, there in the water, it may have seemed to take ages. Oh, stop it, Carol. Just when we're having some fun, why do you? I don't know. But don't you often feel like that? Just when everything is very jolly and exciting, I suddenly think of something awfully serious. Sometimes horrible, like Dad drowning, or that little mad boy I once saw with the huge head, or that old man who walks in the park with that great lump growing out of his oh, face. No, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. They pop up right in the middle of the jolly stuff, you know, Hazel. It happens to Kay, too. So it, it must be in the family a bit. Ah, there you are. Who found them? Good. I didn't think we'd have so many old things left. Mother ought to have given them away. I'm glad she didn't. Besides, who'd have had them? Lots of people would have been glad of them. You'll never realise, Hazel, how wretchedly poor most people are. It just doesn't occur to you, does it? Don't be schoolmistressy, Madge. <gasps> has Gerald Thornton arrived? As a matter of fact, he has. A few minutes ago. I knew it. I could see it in your eyes, Madge. Don't be absurd. He's brought another man with him, a new client of his, who's desperately anxious to know this family. Well, so he ought to be. Nice. Uh, funny little man. Oh, that's just uh, what we want, a funny little man. Perfect for charades. <laughs> no, not that kind. In fact, he probably hasn't any sense of humour. Very shy so far, and terrified of mother. <laughs> Very much the little businessman, I should think. Is he a profiteer, like the ones in Punch? Looks as if he might be someday. His name's Ernest Beavers. <laughs> What is his name? Oh, I'm sorry for his wife if he has one. I gather he hasn't. There you are, Kay. We ought to be starting. Oh, I know. The others are coming. Oh, some good costumes here, ladies. <laughs> oh, look. Grandma's old cape. Oh. Uh, one uh, moment, Lord. What's your name? If I am discovered here, who will believe that my purpose in coming here tonight, visiting your rooms, <laughs> unaccompanied, was solely to obtain the papers that will enable me to clear my husband's name, the name, a man who... Oh, oh no, I'm getting all tied up. <laughs> no, you know, we ought to have a scene like that, all grand and dramatic and, and full of papers. Well, what are we to have? Oh, I've forgotten the word. Hazel, you're the limit. And we spent hours working it out. Oh, I didn't. Only you and Kay, just because you fancy yourselves as budding authoresses and actresses. The word, idiot, is pussyfoot. Puss, see, foot. And then the whole word. I think four scenes are too many. They'll easily guess it. Well, that doesn't matter. It makes them happy if they guess it. The great thing is to dress up. No, okay. Say I'm ready if you are. What a mess you're making. I knew you would. Let me see. Ah, here they are. <laughs> Now I should be a Spanish beauty. I know a song for it, too. <laughs> what did I tell you, Kay? <laughs> what did you tell her, darling? I told Kay whatever she arranged, you'd insist on doing your Spanish turn. Well, why not? It doesn't come into the scenes I thought of, that's all. Oh, you can easily arrange that, Kay. You're so clever. I've just been telling Dr. Halliday and his niece how clever you are. They seem surprised. I can't imagine why. Oh, it's the first time I've seen Monica Halliday out of her land girl costume. <laughs> I'm surprised she didn't turn up tonight in her trousers and leggings. <laughs> she looks quite queer out of them, doesn't she? Rather like a female impersonator. <coughs> oh, come on, Kay. What do we do? The first scene, Puss, is an old lady who's lost her cat. She's really a kind of witch. I'm to be the old lady. Mother, you and Hazel are her two daughters who are visiting her. Oh, I know my bit. I keep saying I always hated that terrible cat of yours, Mother. What can I wear? Well, that's all right, dear. Yeah? I'll be the Spanish daughter, well, she, you see. She didn't have a Spanish daughter, but I suppose it doesn't matter. Not in the least. Nobody cares. And then I think I'd better not appear in the others, because I suppose you'll be wanting me to sing afterwards. Of course, but I'd put you down for two more. Oh, Madge and Joan Helford will have to do those. What a pity Robin isn't here. Do you know, he wrote, he said he might be demobbed any day now, and it seems such a shame just to miss your party. Robin loves parties. He's like me. Your father never cared much for them. Certainly, right in the middle, just as everything was getting along, he'd want to be quiet and take me into a corner and ask me how much longer people were staying, just when they were beginning to enjoy themselves. I never could understand that. I can. I've often felt like that. But why, Kate? Yeah, why? It isn't sensible. 
You're having a party. You're having a party. Yes, it isn't that. And it isn't that you suddenly dislike the people, but you feel, at least I do, and, and I suppose that's what Father felt too, you feel quite suddenly that it isn't real enough, and you want something to be real. Do you see, Mother? No, I don't, my dear. It sounds a little morbid to me. But your father could be quite morbid sometimes. You, you might think so, but he could. And I suppose you take after him. Do you think that sometimes, in a mysterious sort of way, he knew? <laughs> knew what, dear? Oh, look at Hazel. Doesn't she look rather sweet? <laughs> I can remember where I first wore those things. <laughs> Absurd. <laughs> knew what? Knew what was going to happen to him. You know, Alan said that some of the men he knew who were killed in the trenches seemed to know sometimes that they were going to be killed. As if a kind of shadow fell over them. Just as if, now and then, we could see round the corner, into the future. You have the most extraordinary ideas. You must try and put some of them into your book. Are you happy, darling? Yes, Mother. Very happy. That's all right, then. I want you to have a lovely birthday. I feel we all can be happy again now that the horrible war's all over and people are sensible again. Yes. And Robin and Alan are quite safe. Oh, I forgot to ask. Did Robin send you anything, Kay? No. Well, I didn't expect him to. Oh, but that isn't like Robin, you know, Kay. He's a most generous boy. Much too generous, really. Now, that may mean he thinks he's coming home very soon. Hello, Joe. They're in the background. Uh, here they are, Joan. Uh, you'll need to find a costume. Oh, thank you, Alan. Alan, tell them we're beginning, and it's three syllables. All right. Oh, I think you all look marvellous. Well, I'm rotten at this, you know, Kay. Don't say I didn't warn you. Now then, Carol, mm -hmm. you start. And remember, only say puss once. Don't you two say it, only Carol. <laughs> Good old Carol. Now then, Madge, Joan, mm -hmm. the next syllable is S-Y. So I thought it wouldn't be cheating too badly if we called that Psy. You know, Cockney, I Psy, but... So this is an East End scene. Madge, you're the old mother. Yes, I remembered. I'm ready. Uh, what am I? I forget. You're Bert. Just put something silly on. Uh, is, is there anything here you can wear, Joan? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I was in London last week, staying with my uncle, and we went to the theatre three times. We saw uh, Tilly of Bloomsbury and Cinderella Man and Kissing Time. I liked Cinderella Man best. Owen Mares, you know. I thought Robin was coming home soon. He is. He's an officer, isn't he? You weren't an officer, were you, Alan? Uh, no. I was a lance corporal. One stripe, you know. Nothing at all. Didn't you want to be anything better than that? No. Alan has no ambition at all, have you, my pet? Well, not much. If I were a man, I'd want to be very important. What are you doing now, Alan? Somebody said you were at the town hall. I am, in the rate office. Just a clerk, you know. Isn't it dull? Yes. Alan never minds being dull. I believe he has tremendous long adventures inside his head that nobody knows anything about. <laughs> Hazel said you've started to write another novel, Kay. Have you? Yes. Oh, I don't know how you can. I mean, I think I'd be all right once I'd started properly, but I can't see how you start. What did you do with the last one? Burnt it. Why? It was putrid. But wasn't that an awful waste of time? Yes, I suppose so. Well, still, look at the time you and I waste, Joan. Oh. Oh, no, I I'm always doing something. Even though I haven't to go to the canteen anymore, I'm always busy. <laughs> Why do you laugh, Madge? Can't a girl laugh? You always did laugh at me, Madge. I suppose because I'm not clever like you. Well, you can imagine what happened. Mother let herself go and of course it became all Spanish. I don't believe they'll ever remember hearing Puss mentioned. What are you supposed to be, Joan? Oh, can't you see, Hazel? A, a sort of Costa girl. Oh, you look a sort of general mess. Oh, and Kay, Carol wants to do Mr. Pennyman at the paper shop instead of a general for the third syllable. Well, how can she? If it's soldiers drilling, you can't have Mr. Pennyman... Unless we make him another soldier and get Gerald Thornton or somebody to be a general. Mother's still on. Oh, golly, it's baking being an old witch. <laughs> do you insist on being Miss Pennyman in the third syllable? Oh, I'd forgotten that. Yes, please let me do Mr. Pennyman, Kay. My lamb, my love, my treasure. <laughs> All right, Carol. But he'll have to be a soldier. Just joined up, you see. Mm -hmm. 
really, that was very silly, but they <laughs> seem to enjoy it. That's the great thing. I thought you were very good, Carol. <laughs> Carol was sweet, Kate. Now, don't ask me to do any more of this, because I really mustn't, <laughs> especially if you want me to sing afterwards. So leave me out, Kate. All right, now, come on. <laughs> Honestly, Kate, I'll be all for It doesn't matter. You've nothing to do. Now then, Madge. <laughs> now then, Bert and you, Daisy, come along or we'll be like <laughs> <laughs> How on earth did you get that claret cup, Mother? I got Gerald Ford to hand it to me and it rounded off my little scene nicely. I, I don't want any more. Would you like it? Mother, you weren't going to be an actress, were you? Just a singer. Well, I don't know what you mean by just a singer. I was a singer, certainly, but I did some acting, too. When the Newlingham Amateur Operatic first did Merry England, I played Bess. And I'd had all your children then. You were only about two, Carol. But Mother, Joan did stay in London last week and she went to three theatres. She has relatives there and we haven't, Hazel. That makes a great difference. Aren't we ever going? Yes, of course. Perhaps Robin will take us. I mean, just you and me, when he comes back. It says in the paper this morning that we must all get on with our jobs. <sighs> this mere rush for amusement has gone on long enough now. There's work waiting to be done. What a fat lot of rushing for amusement we've done, haven't we? I think that's frightfully unfair and idiotic, just when we might have some fun. After washing up in canteens and hospitals and queuing for foul food, with nobody about at all, they go and say, we've had enough amusement and must get on with our jobs. What jobs? Rebuilding a shattered world. It says that too. Your job, Hazel, will be to find a very nice young man and marry him, and that oughtn't to be difficult for you. <laughs> oh, hurry up, Hazel. Then I can be a bridesmaid. I believe you're my only chance. Kay says she won't get married for ages, if ever, because her writing, her work, must come first. Oh, that's nonsense, my dear. When the proper young man comes along, she'll forget all about her writing. I don't believe she will, Mother. And anyhow, she won't have bridesmaids. And if Madge ever marries, I know it'll be to some kind of socialist in a tweed suit who will insist on being married in a register oh, office. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I've had my eye on Madge lately. And I've had my eye on Lloyd George. <laughs> and what for, Mish Conway? Because you can't trust that little Welshman. You watch him, that's all I say. <laughs> that's very good, dear. You're rather like Mr. Worsnop. Do you remember him, the cashier at the works? Every New Year's Eve, your father used to bring Mr. Worsnop here after they'd done all the books at the office. He used to give him some port. And when I went in, Mr. Worsnop always stood and held his glass like this <laughs> and said, My respects, Mrs. Cobway, my deepest respect. And I always wanted to laugh. Oh, he's retired now, gone to live in South Devon. They say if coal is as important as you say it is, then the mines shouldn't be in the hands of the private owners any longer. Nationalise them, they say. That's the fairest thing. All right, Madge, but supposing we don't want them nationalised, what then? Some of us have seen enough of government mismanagement already. Quite so, Gerald. Everybody knows how ridiculous they were, sending bags of sand to Egypt. <laughs> I don't believe half those stories. Besides, they had to improvise everything in a hurry. And anyhow, it wasn't a socialist government. But you don't know they would be any better. They might be worse. Less experience. Oh, I know that experience. We're always having that flung in our faces. When all that's wanted is a little intelligence, an enthusiasm, decency. It seems, Mrs Conway, that I've been conscripted for the next scene. <laughs> to be a general or something. No, we haven't fancy dress for you. Very good. I really mustn't neglect them any longer, must I? And most of them will be going soon. Then we can have a nice, cosy little party of our own. Well, Gerald, you must look different somehow, you know. You could turn your coat inside out. Oh, I don't think that would be very effective. Oh, wear an overcoat, then. Oh, and put this moustache on. That's a very good one. Yeah. Do you know who's here? You'll never guess. Who? That awful little man who always stares at you. The one who followed us once all round the park. He's not. He is, I tell you. I distinctly saw him standing at the side near the door. Oh, this sounds like my friend Beavers. What? Do you mean to say that the man you brought is that awful little man? Well, you're the absolute limit, Gerald Thornton. He's a dreadful little creature. Well, every time I go out, he's somewhere about, staring and staring at me. And now you bring him here. Oh, he's not so bad. He insisted on my bringing him, and your mother said it was all right. You shouldn't be so devastating, Hazel. <laughs> I told you he must be mad about you, Hazel. No, I swear I won't speak to him. He would just butt in like this. Why shouldn't he? Poor little man. Oh, shut up, Carol. You don't know anything about him. Hurry up, Alan. You need to put something different on. Oh, really? Oh, that wasn't much good. The costas were a washout. Oh, 
That's all right, Carol. Now, you're a general, Gerald, and the others are recruits. Gerald, you're inspecting them. You know, make up something silly and then say to one of them, look at your foot, my man. Anyhow, bring in foot. Have I only two recruits, Carol and Alan? No, Mother's sending in another man. They aren't guessing anything yet, but that's simply because it's all such a muddle. I don't think I like charades as much as I used to do. Dad was marvellous at them. He always did very fat men. Well, you'd better be a fat general, Gerald. And you can be fat too, Alan. Uh, Mrs Conway told me to come in here. Yes, of course. You have to be one of the recruits in this next bit. I'm not much good at this sort of thing, you know. Well, it doesn't matter. Just be silly. Oh, uh, Beavers. <laughs> Sorry, I I'd better introduce you. This is Mr Ernest Beavers, a rather recent arrival in our uh, progressive city. Now, all these are Conways, except this young lady, Miss Joan Helford. <laughs> How do you do? <laughs> How do you do? This is Kay, who decided to be 21 today so that we could have this party. Many happy returns. Thank you. She's the literary genius of this distinguished family. Over there is Madge, who's been to Girton and will try to convert you to socialism. Oh, Gerald. I'm afraid she won't succeed. This strange-looking, middle-aged person is young Carol. Hello. Hello. Alan, I think you've met already. Oh, and let me see. Yes, this is Hazel. She creates such havoc that when the Lesters were stationed here, the Colonel wrote and asked her to stay indoors when they had route marches. How do you do? <laughs> you'd, uh, you'd better do something funny to yourself, Mr. Beavers. Oh, Is right. there anything here you'd like? Uh, right. <laughs> Carol and Alan, you start. You're recruits. Carol can do bits of Mr. Pennyman to fill in. Rightio. Come on, Alan. Oh. Okay. Right. What did your mother say, Hazel, about removing? Oh, of course, she won't think of it. And she's been offered £5,000. £5,000 for this house? Oh. Tell her to take it. I'll bet in ten years she couldn't get 2000 It's only this temporary shortage that's forced prices of property up. You'll see them come down with a bang yet. But she adores being here, of course. And so it's hopeless. If I spoke out of my turn, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Beavers and you, Gerald. Uh, I'm no good at this, you know, Miss Conway. It's, it's no use pretending that I am. Oh, dear. <laughs> I don't think it's funny, Joan. I'm furious. <laughs> you look so silly. <laughs> Did you hear him? If I spoke out of my turn, I'm sorry. We ought to have said, pleased to meet you, and then he'd have said, granted. <laughs> I think you were rather beastly to that little man. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. But that's the little man I told you about, Kay, who always stared and once followed us round. Mm. Well, now he'll be able to raise his little hat. <laughs> and that's jolly well all he'll get out of this, I'll tell you. And I think Gerald Thornton had the cheek of the devil to bring him here, just because he's a new client. You don't think you'll marry him then, Hazel? <laughs> I'd just as soon marry a... A ferret. I don't believe you two ever think or talk about anything but clothes and going to London and young men and marriage. Oh, don't you start being so grand. The Garden of Stars. Oh, now shut up, Hazel. <laughs> That's what she called the last novel she started, Joan. The Garden of Stars. <laughs> and there were so many bits of paper with the opening words on that I know them off by heart. <laughs> uh, stop. Marion went out into the still oh, shoot shoot. night. There was no oh, moon really already. Not. Already the no. sky was oh, silver dusted oh, with oh, stars. Sh she passed through the rose garden, the dying scent of the roses meeting the green moss. No, I know it's all wrong, but I tore it up, didn't I? Yes, my duck. And then you cried. Well, I've just begun a real one with some guts in it you'll see well, I'll bet it's about a girl who lives in a town just like Newlyn well why shouldn't that's it be true, you wait but that's you all you can't expect people to behave differently when they've still got their war restrictions on everything you can't have it both ways well there's still a lot of profiteering you've got to let business find its own level the more interference the worse it is what, the worse for everybody yes I doubt it uh, you're working in the town hall aren't you Alan? Well, you can't learn much about these things there you know I say you three chaps must have been terribly good in the charade weren't you no no, we weren't very amusing. Oh, they were awful. No, you weren't too bad, Mr. Beavers, especially for a man who was doing a charade in a strange house. Now I call that handsome, Miss Carroll. The whole word now, pussyfoot. 
It's supposed to be a party in America and we can't have anything to drink. We won't bother dressing up for this, just some good acting. I'll say the word. Joan, tell Madge she's in this. Just the girls for the grand finale. I'll get her. So we're sacked? Yes, no good. Well, then we can give ourselves a drink. We've earned a drink. Any dancing afterwards? Well, there might be, after Mother's done her singing. Do you dance, Beavers? No, never had time for it. Oh, yes, we must have some dancing, Gerald. You mentioned a drink, Gerald. <clears throat> right, follow me. Kay, we could have done the Prince of Wales in America for this last scene. Why didn't we think of it? You could be the Prince of Wales, and you could fall in love with Hazel, who could turn out to be Pussyfoot's daughter. <laughs> Mother would be shocked. And so would some of the others. I'd hate to be a Prince of Wales, wouldn't you? Oh, I'd love it. Old Mrs. Ferguson, you know, the one with the queer eye, the rather frightening one, told me there was an old prophecy that when King David came to the throne of Britain, everything would be wonderful. What's that? Oh, oh, kids. Oh. Hazel. Okay, many happies. Oh. Carol, my old hearty. Oh, gosh. I've had a dash to get here in time. Did half the journey on one of our lorries. And I didn't forget the occasion, Kay. What about that? All right, isn't it? A scarf. Silk. It's lovely, Robin. Lovely, lovely. Oh, that's the stuff to give her. And I finished. Out. Demobbed at last. Oh, Rand. Have you seen Mother? Of course I have, you chump. You ought to have seen her face when I told her I was now a civilian again. Oh, golly, we'll have some fun now, won't we? <laughs> lots and lots. Have you seen Alan? Uh, just for a second. Still the solemn old bird, isn't he? In my opinion, Alan is a very wonderful person. I know. You always thought that, didn't you? Can't quite see it myself, but I'm very fond of the old crawler. How's the writing, Kay? I'm still writing and learning. That's the stuff. We'll show him. This is where the Conways really begin. Hmm. How many young men, Hazel? <laughs> Nobody to speak of. <laughs> She'd worked her way up to colonels, hadn't you, Hayes? Well, now that it's civilian, she's having to change her technique, and she's a bit uncertain yet. <laughs> All jealousy, that, isn't it, Hazel? <laughs> oh, oh. oh, Mother, let me take that. Isn't this nice? Now we're all here. I knew somehow you were on your way, Robin. Even though you didn't tell us, you naughty boy. Couldn't, Mother, honestly. Only wangled it at the last minute. Finish your charade now, Kay, dear. Charade? Can I be in this? I, I used to be an ace at charades. <laughs> no, dear, they're just finishing. We can have as many charades as we want. Now you're home for good. <laughs> have something to eat and talk to me while they're doing the last bit. Well, come on, you two. We can collect Madge out there. Remember, it's an American party and we can't have anything to drink. And then, after kicking up a row, you ask who's giving the party and then I'll say... <laughs> <laughs> Is there everything you want there, Robin? Yes, thanks, Mother. Gosh, you don't know what it feels like to be out at last. I do, you silly boy. What do you think I feel to have you back at last, for good? I must get some clothes. Yes, some really nice ones. Though it's a pity you can't keep on wearing that uniform. You look so smart in it. <laughs> Poor Alan, he was only a corporal or something, you know, and had the most hideous uniform. Nothing seemed to fit him. Alan never looked right in the army. He's got a piffling sort of job at the town hall, hasn't he? Yes, he seems to like it, though. And perhaps he'll find something better later on. We've got all sorts of plans, you know, Mother. Mm -hmm. We've been talking things over in the mess. Look, one of our chaps knows Jimmy White. You know the Jimmy White? Mm -hmm. you've, you've heard of him. and He thinks he can wangle me an introduction to him. My idea is something in the car and motorbike line. I understand them. Mm -hmm. I've heard people are buying like mad. And I have my gratuity, you know. Yes, dear. We'll have to talk about all that. There's plenty of time now, thank goodness. Mm. Don't you think all the girls are looking well? Yes, first rate. Especially Hazel. Oh, of course. Hazel's the one everybody notices. You ought to have seen a young man. And Kay, 21. I can mm. hardly believe it. But she's very grown up and serious now. I don't know whether she'll make anything out of this writing of hers, but she's trying very hard. Don't tease her too much, dear. She doesn't like it. I haven't been teasing her. No, but Hazel does sometimes, and I know what you children are. Madge has been teaching, you know, but she's trying for a much better school. Good old Madge. I think I ought to go up to town for my clothes, Mother. Mm -hmm. You can't get anything really decent in Newlingham, and if I'm going to start selling cars, I've got to look like somebody who knows a good suit when he sees one. <laughs> Lord, it's grand to be back again. And not just on a filthy little leave. Dear Mother, steady. Nothing to cry about now. I know. 
And that's why. You see, Robin, losing your father, then the war coming, taking you. I'm not used to happiness. I've forgotten about it. It's upsetting. And Robin, now you are back, don't go rushing off again, please. Don't leave us, not for years and years. Let's all be cosy together and happy again, shall we? Ah. Um, Mrs Conway, they, they finished the charade and some people are going and, and Madge asked me to tell you they're expecting you to sing something. Why didn't she come herself? Well, she and Kay and Carol began handing people sandwiches and things as soon as they finished the charade. Hello, Jane. Hello, Robin. Is it nice to be back again? Yes, of course. Really, this room's a dreadful mess. I knew it would be. Hazel and Carol brought all these things down here. Joan, go and tell them they must take these things upstairs at once. I can't have this room looking like an old clothes place. Perhaps you'd like to help them, dear. Oh, yes, rather. You're looking very artful, Mother. Am I? I'm not feeling very artful. Joan's grown up to be a very nice-looking girl, hasn't she? Quite. And I think she's got a pleasant, easy disposition. Not very clever or go-ahead or anything like that, but a thoroughly nice girl. Yes, I bet she is. Oh, they're all panting for a song, Mother. They don't even mind if it's German. Well, thank goodness. I was never so stupid as to stop singing German songs. What have Schubert and Schumann got to do with Hindenburg and the Kaiser? Everybody guessed the charade just because it was pussyfoot. Now, they hadn't guessed any of the syllables. All except Mr. James, who thought it was kinema. When they say kinema, I can't believe I've ever been to one. It sounds like some other kind of place. Robin, have you seen William S. Hart? Yes. Oh, I love William S. Hart. <laughs> I wonder what S stands for. Sydney. Robin! <laughs> it doesn't. Come along, Robin. I may want you and Alan to move the piano for me. Right up. Have you suddenly been inspired? Uh, no, not really. But I'm bursting with all kinds of feelings and thoughts and impressions, you know? Oh, yes, so am I. Millions and millions. I couldn't possibly begin to write them. No, but in my novel, a girl goes to a party, you see, and there are some things I've been feeling. Very subtle things that I know she'd feel. I want my novel to be very real this time, so I had to scribble them down. Will you tell them me afterwards? Yes. Bedroom? Yes, if you're not too sleepy. <laughs> I couldn't be. Kay, I think you're wonderful. I think life's wonderful. You both are. Kay writes for another moment, then, moved by both the music and the sudden ecstasy of creation, she puts down pencil and paper, drifts over to the switch and turns out the lights. She goes to the window and opens the curtain so that when she sits on the window seat, her head is silvered in moonlight. Very still, she listens to the music and seems to stare not at, but into something. For a moment, we think nothing has happened. There is Kay still sitting on the window seat where we left her. But then Alan comes in and switches on the central light, and we see that a great deal must have happened. It is the same room, but it has a different wallpaper. The furniture has been changed round. The pictures and books are not altogether the same as before. We notice a wireless set. The general effect is harder and rather brighter than it was during the party in 1919, and we guess at once that this is the present day, 1938. Kay and Alan are not quite the same after nearly 20 years. Kay has a rather hard, efficient, well-groomed look, that of a woman of 40 who has earned her own living for years. Alan, in his mid-40s, is shabbier than he was before. 
His coat does not match the rest of his suit, and really will not do. But he is still the rather shy, awkward, lovable fellow. Only now there is about him a certain poise, an inward certainty and serenity, missing from all the others we shall see now. Well, Kay? <laughs> Alan. <laughs> <laughs> My, oh. <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad you could come. It was the only thing about this business that didn't make me hate the thought of it, the chance mm. you might be able to come. But Mother says you're not staying the night. No, I can't, Alan. I must get back to London tonight. Mm. Work? Yes. I have to go to Southampton in the morning to write a nice little piece about the newest little film star. Oh, do you often have to do that? Yes, Alan, quite often. There are an awful lot of film stars, and they're always arriving at Southampton. Except when they arrive at Plymouth, damn their eyes. And all the women readers of the Daily Courier like to read a bright half-column about their glamorous <laughs> favourites. Well, they, they look very nice, but all rather, well, rather alike. Well, they are all rather alike. And so are my bright interviews with them. In fact, sometimes I feel we're all just going round and round like poor old circus ponies. <laughs> are you writing another novel? No, my dear, I'm not. I tell myself too many people are writing novels. Well, it, it does look like that sometimes. Yes, but that's not the real reason. I still feel mine wouldn't be like theirs. Anyhow, not the next, even if the last was. But well, as things are, I, I just can't... <laughs> the, uh, the last time you wrote, Kay, I mean to me, you sounded rather unhappy, I thought. I was. I suppose that's why I suddenly remembered you and, and wrote... It's not very flattering to you, is it? Well, in a way it is, you know. Yes, Kay, I'd take that as a compliment. <laughs> Alan. Oh, and I loathe that coat you're wearing. It doesn't match the rest of you, does it? Uh, no. Well, well, you see, I, I just wear it in the house. An old coat, just a house coat. It says my other one. I ought to have put it on tonight, just a habit, you know. <laughs> I'll change it before the others come. Why, uh, why were you so unhappy then, the last time you wrote? Oh, something that it was always ending it really did come to an end just then it it had lasted ten years <laughs> off and on and eating more of one's life away when it was off than when it was on it, it was married there were children it was the usual nasty model <laughs> Alan mm -hmm. you don't know what day it is today ah <laughs> but I do I do no. <laughs> <laughs> oh Alan Oh, you're an angel. Oh, I never thought I'd have another single birthday present. <laughs> and you know how old I am now? Forty. Forty? Well, I'm forty-four. It's all right, you know. You'll like it. Now, look at your present. I, I hope it's all right. <laughs> oh. You come in, Joe. Thank you. Oh, hello, Ken. I didn't think you'd manage to be here. You hardly ever do come to Newlingham now, do you? And I must say, I don't blame you. Oh, a new handbag. Nice, isn't it? Alan's just given it to me. Oh. How are the children? Oh, Richard's very well. But the doctor says Anne's tonsils ought to come out. Oh. No, he doesn't tell me who's going to pay for the operation. Never thinks about that. They did enjoy those things you sent at Christmas, Kay. Yeah. I don't know what they'd have done without them. Though I did my best. Well, I'm sure you did, Joan. Alan was very good to them, too, weren't you, Alan? Uh -huh. Though, of course, it's not like they're having a father. You know, I haven't seen Robin for months. Some people say I ought to divorce him, but uh, I uh, don't know. Honestly, isn't it awful? Okay. Oh. <laughs> Doesn't that sound silly? OK. <laughs> no, I've stopped noticing. Oh, Richard's always saying OK. He's heard it at the pictures. And, of course, Anne copies him. Do you think it's all right, my coming here tonight? It was Hazel who told me you were having a sort of family meeting and she thought I ought to be here, and I, I think so too. But, but Granny Conway didn't <laughs> ask me. Joan, you don't call Mother Granny Conway. Well, I got into the habit, you know, with the children. <laughs> she must loathe it. Well, I think she does, you know. Well, I must try and remember. Is she upstairs? Yes. Uh, Madge is here, too. Right. I, I think I'll go up and ask her if it's all right, my staying. Otherwise, I'd feel such a fool. Yes, do. And tell her we think you ought to be here, if you want to be. Well, it isn't that. But you see, if it's about money, well, I must know something, mustn't I? After all, I'm Robin's wife. 
And Richard and Anne are his children. Yes, Joan, you tell Mother that if she objects, but she won't, though. Right. Hmm? Okay. I suppose Robin's pretty hopeless, but really, Joan's such a fool. Yes, but the way Robin's treated her has made her feel more of a fool than she really is. It's taken away all her confidence in herself, you see, Kay. Otherwise, she mightn't have been so bad. You used to like Joan, didn't you? You remember when she and Robin told us they were engaged? Mm. I was in love with her then. That was the only time I ever fell in love with anybody. And I remember quite suddenly hating Robin. <laughs> yeah, yes, really hating him. <laughs> None of this loving or hating lasted, of course. It was just silly stuff, but I, I remember it quite well. Suppose it had been you instead of Robin. Oh, no. No, that wouldn't have done at all. Really, it wouldn't. <laughs> Most unsuitable. <laughs> You're here, Kay. Hello, Madge. I've just told Mother that if I hadn't happened to be in the neighbourhood today, nothing would have induced me to be here tonight. I've applied for a headship at Borderton, you know. I had my interview there this afternoon. Oh, you are here, Madge. That's all that matters. No, it isn't. I want her to understand quite clearly that I've no further interest in these family muddles, financial or otherwise. Also, that I would have thought it unnecessary to ask for a day away from my work at Collingfield in order to attend one of these ridiculous hysterical conferences. Oh, you talk as if you've been dragged here every few weeks. No, I haven't. But I've had a great many more of these silly discussions than you have, please remember, Kay. Mother and Gerald Thornton seem to imagine that the time of a woman journalist in London is far more precious than that of a senior mistress at a large girl's public school. Why, I can't think. But the result is I've been dragged in often when you haven't. All right, but seeing we're both here, let's make the best of it. Yes, of course. Joan's here. I hope there's no chance of Robin coming too. That's something you've missed so far, I think, Kay. I've had one experience of their suddenly meeting here. Robin half drunk, ready to insult everybody. Joan weeping and resentful. The pair of them discussing every unpleasant detail of their private life. Mm. And it's not an experience I want to repeat. Oh, I don't blame you, Madge. But for the Lord's sake, be human tonight. You're not talking to the Collingfield common room now. This is your nice brother, Alan. Mm. And I'm your nice sister, Kay. We know all about you. So That's just where you're wrong. You know hardly anything about me. Any of you. The life you don't see, call it the Collingfield common room if that amuses you, is my real life. It represents exactly the sort of person I am now. And what you and Alan and Mother remember, and trust Mother not to forget anything foolish and embarrassing, is no longer of any importance at all. Oh, I'd hate to think that, Madge. Uh, and it isn't true. It really isn't. Because... I heard your extraordinary views the last time I was here, Alan. I also discussed them with Herrickson, our senior maths mistress and most brilliant woman, and she demolished them very thoroughly. Will you tell me, Alan, if there's time later on? We're not going to be trampled on by any of Madge's Miss What's-Her-Names, and we don't care how brilliant they are, do we, Alan? <laughs> I hope well. you're doing something besides this popular journalism now, Kay. Have you begun another book? No. Pity, isn't it? Well, what about you, Madge? Are you building Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land? Possibly not. But I'm trying to put a little knowledge of history and a little sense into the heads of 150 middle-class girls. It's hard work and useful work. Certainly nothing to be shamed of. Then why be ashamed? I'm not! Hello, Madge. Okay. Hazel, oh. my dear. You look grander every time I see you. <laughs> Do you like it? Yes. And you didn't get that in Newley, at the Bon Marché. Oh. Do you remember when we used to think the Bon Marché marvellous? <laughs> yes. And now they seem ghastly. Well, that's something, isn't it? Is Joan here? Uh, yes, she's upstairs with Mother. I is Ernest coming tonight? Oh, I, I don't know. I thought it was understood he was coming. Mother thinks he is. I believe she's rather counting on him. Well, she mustn't. I've told her not to. I, I don't even know yet if he'll be here at all. But this is ridiculous. We're told that things are desperate. Kay and I have to leave our work, travel miles and miles, stop thinking about anything else, and now you don't even know if your own husband will walk down the road to be here. But you know what Ernest is. He said he might come tonight. I asked him again only at lunchtime today, and he said he didn't know. And then I, I didn't like to... Oh, didn't like? You mean you didn't? With a miserable little... Madge... 
Please stop. How are the children? Peter has a cold again, poor lamb. He's always getting colds. Margaret's all right. Never any trouble with her. She's been doing some ballet dancing, you know. Mm. The teacher thinks she's marvellous for her age. Oh, you forgot her last birthday, Kay. The child was so disappointed. I'm sorry. Uh, tell her I'll make up for it at Christmas. Mm. Um, must have been away on a job or something. I read your article on Glenna Foss, you know, about three months ago, when she came over from Hollywood. Did she really say all those things to you, Kay, or did you make them up? Well, she said some of them. The rest I made up. Oh, did she say anything about Leo Frobisher, her husband? You know, and they just separated. Yes, but I didn't print it. And what did she say? She said, I'll bet that godforgotten leftover ham husband of mine gets himself poured out of the next boat. You'd like her, Hazel. She's a sweet child. Oh, she sounds awful. But I suppose you can't judge by the way they talk using all that slang. Oh, and I know you don't think you're very lucky, Kay. I vary. Sometimes, when I manage to remember what most women go through, all kinds of women all over the world, I don't think. I know I'm lucky. But usually, I feel clean out of luck. I know. That's what I say. But I think you're very lucky, meeting all these people and being in London and all that. Look at me, still in Newlingham. And I loathe Newlingham. And it gets worse and worse, doesn't it, Alan? Mm. Although, I don't suppose you notice. Well, I think it's about the same. Well, perhaps we get worse, that's all. Somebody was saying to me only the other day how queer they thought you were, Alan. And you are really, aren't you? I mean, you don't seem to bother about everything as most people do. I've often wondered whether you're happy inside or just dull. But I often wonder about people like that. Don't you, Kay? Although, I suppose, being so clever now and a writer and everything, you know about them, but I don't. Mm. And I simply can't tell from what people look like. We had a maid, you know, Jessie, and she seemed such a cheerful little thing, always smiling and humming. <laughs> Ernest used to get quite cross with her. She was too cheerful, really. And then suddenly she took over 20 aspirins all at once. We had to have the doctor and everything. And she said it was simply because she couldn't bear it any longer. She'd had enough of everything, she said. Isn't it strange? But you must feel like that sometimes, don't you? Yes, I do. But I'm always surprised when other people do, because somehow they never look it. Oh, Robin rang me up yesterday. He's living in Leicester just now, you know, and, and I told him about tonight, and he said he might look in because he wouldn't be far away. I hope he doesn't. What's he doing now, Hazel? Oh, I don't know, really. He's always changing, you know, but it's something to do with commission. Shall I tell Joan he might be coming here? No, risk it. <clears throat> now then, Hazel, haven't you brought Ernest with you? No, Mother. I hope he'll be here soon. Well, of course he will. Well, we can't do anything until Gerald arrives. He knows how things are, exactly. Where's Madge? Oh, I thought she went upstairs. Ah, oh, she's probably taking something in the bathroom. I've never known anybody who took so many things as poor Madge. She's given herself so many lotions and gargles and sprays that no man has ever looked at her twice, poor thing. Alan, I think we ought to have both port and whiskey out, don't you? I told the girl to leave it all in the dining room. You'd better bring it in. Right here. Now, what I'm wondering is this. Should we all sit around looking very stiff and formal, you know, make it a proper business affair? Because, after all, it is a business affair. Or should we make everybody comfortable and cosy? What do you think? I think, Mother, you're enjoying this. Well, after all, why shouldn't I? It's nice to see all you children at home again. Even Madge. Yes, Mother? Ah, Madge. I say it's nice to see all you children home again, even you. I'm not a child, and this is no longer my home. You were a child once, and a very troublesome one too. And for 20 years this was your home, and please don't talk to me in that tone. You're not in a classroom now, remember? Now, Mother, please. It's not going to be easy tonight, and... Don't worry, Hazel. Mother enjoys things not being easy. <sighs> Kay, who was the man the Philipson saw you dining with at the... Oh, what's the name of that restaurant? The Ivy, Mother. Yes. The man is a man called Hugo Steele. I've told you already. Yes, dear, but you didn't tell me much. The Philipson said you seemed awfully friendly together. I suppose he's an old friend? Yes. Isn't it a pity you couldn't... I mean, if he's a really nice man... Yes, a great pity. I've so often hoped you'd be settled with some nice man, and when the Philipsons told me... That Mother, you... I'm 40 today. 
Had you forgotten? Of course I hadn't. A mother always remembers. Joan? Yes, Granny Conway. Oh, don't call me that ridiculous name. Oh, I forgot, I'm sorry. Didn't I tell you it was Kay's birthday? Here, Kay, I have something for you. No, Mother, you mustn't, really. There. Your father gave me that. The second Christmas after we were married. And it's a charming little brooch. Oh. Brazilian diamonds. It was an old piece then. Look at the colour in the stones. You always get that in the old South American diamonds. There now. It's very sweet of you, Mother, but really, I'd rather not take this from you. Don't be absurd. It's mine, and now I give it to you. Take it, or I'll be cross. And many happy returns, of course. <laughs> Do you know, when you were younger, I never liked you as much as I did Hazel. Now I think I was wrong. Oh, Mother. I know, Hazel, dear, but you're such a fool with that little husband of yours. Why, if he were mine... Well, he I'm... isn't. And you really know very little about him. It's time the men were here. I've always hated seeing a lot of women sitting about with no men. They always look silly, and then I feel silly myself. I don't know why. Oh, of course you're here, Alan. I was forgetting you. Or forgetting you were a man. Well, I must grow a shaggy beard and drum on my chest and uh, roar. <laughs> <laughs> when their Uncle Frank, you know, Frida's husband, they live in London, took the children to the zoo for the first time, little Richard was only five, and there was an enormous monkey. <sighs> What Alan said reminded me. Would anybody like a glass of port? Kay? Hazel? What about you, Madge? It is a scholarly wine. You remember what Meredith wrote about it in The Egoist? Oh, nobody reads Meredith now, and nobody takes port. I used to read Meredith when I was a girl. I thought I was very clever. But I didn't like port then. Now I don't care about Meredith, but I rather like port. <laughs> Ugh, it's not good port, this. Even I know that. The men always say women don't know anything about it, but it's rich and warming. Even this, like a handsome compliment. That's gone too. Nobody pays compliments anymore, except old Dr. Halliday, who's well over 80 and has no memory at all. He talked to me for half an hour the other day, thinking I was Mrs. Rushbury. <laughs> there, that's probably Gerald. Oh, I'll go. At last. Yes, Madge, but you mustn't be so impatient. It's jolly decent of you to come, Alice. Well, here we are then. Well, Gerald, will you have a drink before we begin talking? No, thank you. How are you, Kay? Quite well, thank you, Gerald. I'm sorry, but it's true. What is? I always remember your saying years ago that you didn't mind living in Newlingham, but you were determined to be as different as possible from the Newlingham type of man. I don't remember saying that. Yes, you did. And now I'm sorry, Gerald, but it's true. You suddenly look like all those Newlingham men rolled into one. What do I do? Apologise. Oh, Ernest, I'm so glad you're here. You are, eh? Oh, I suppose that means you won't stay now, just to show me. I don't need to show you. You know by this time. Ernest, please, be nice to them tonight. Especially to Mother. You could be such a help if you wanted to be. I don't know what you're talking about. Now then, everybody, please be quiet and pay attention. <clears throat> We must be very businesslike, mustn't we, Gerald? I'm so glad you were able to come, Ernest. You'll help us to be businesslike, won't you? Yes. And that doesn't mean you're at liberty to make yourself unpleasant. Be quiet, Madge. Now then, Gerald, we're all waiting. Tell us all about it. <clears throat> Acting under instructions from Mrs Conway, after it was decided you should all meet here, I have prepared a short statement of Mrs Conway's present Gerald. financial position. Yes? Must you talk in that awful, dry, inhuman way? I mean, after all, I've known you since you were a boy, and the children have known you all their lives, and you're beginning to talk as if you'd never seen any of us before. And it sounds so horrid. But I'm not here now as a friend of the family, but as your solicitor. No, you're, you're here as a friend of the family who also happens to be my solicitor. And I think it would be much better if you told us all in a simple, friendly way what the position is. Well, I think that would be better, you know, Gerald. So do I. When you turn on that legal manner, I can't take you seriously. I feel you're still acting one of our old charades. <laughs> oh, weren't they fun? And you were so good in them, Gerald. Why can't we have some more? What, at your age? Well, I don't see why not. Mother was older than we are now, and she used to play. You're not proposing to turn this into a charade, are you, Hazel? What a pity it isn't one. Well, perhaps it is. Oh, now, don't you start being silly, Alan. Now then, Gerald, just 
tell us how things are and don't read out a lot of figures and dates and things. I know you brought them with you, but keep them for anybody who wants to have a look at them. Perhaps you'd like to have a look at them afterwards, Ernest. I might. Go ahead, Gerald. <clears throat> well, the position is this. Mrs Conway, for a long time now, has derived her income from two sources, a holding in Farrow and Conway Limited and some property in Newlingham, the houses at the north end of Church Road. Farrow and Conway were hit badly by the slump and have not recovered yet. The houses in Church Road are not worth anything like what they were, and the only chance of making that property pay is to convert the houses into flats. But this would demand a substantial outlay of capital. Mrs Conway has received an offer for her holding in Farrow and Conway Limited, but it is a very poor offer. It would not pay for the reconstruction of the Church Road property. Meanwhile, that property may soon be a liability instead of an asset. So, you see, the position is very serious. I must say I'm very much surprised. I always understood that Mother was left extremely well provided for. Certainly I was, Madge. Your father saw to that. Both the shares and the property have declined in value. Yes, but even so, I'm still surprised. Mother must have been very extravagant. Uh, Mrs Conway hasn't been as careful as she might have been. Well, there were six of you to bring up and educate. It isn't that. I know how much we cost. It's since then that the money's been spent. And I know who must have had most of it. Robin. That'll do, Madge. It was my money. It wasn't. It was only yours to hold in trust for us. Alan, you're the eldest, and you've been here all the time. Why didn't you do something? Well, I'm afraid I haven't bothered much about these things. Then you ought to have done. I think it's absolutely wicked. I've been working hard, earning my living for over 20 years. And I've looked forward to having something from what Father left. Enough to pay for a few really good holidays, or to buy myself a little house of my own. And now it's all gone. Just because Mother and Robin, between them, have flung it away. You ought to be ashamed of yourself talking like that. What if I have helped Robin? He needed it, and I'm his mother. If you'd needed it, I'd have helped you too. You wouldn't. When I told you I had a chance to buy a partnership in that school, you only laughed at me. Because you were all right where you were, and you didn't need to buy any partnerships. And Robin did, I suppose. Yes, because he's a man with a wife and children to support. This is just typical of you, Madge. Call yourself a socialist and blame people for taking an interest in money, and then it turns out you're the most mercenary of us all. I don't call myself a socialist, though that's got nothing to do with it. How long does this go on? Because I've something else to do. Uh, that's all right, Ernest. Oh, look what you've done now, Madge. You made Joan cry. Oh, I'm sorry, I just remember too many things. That's all. At the present moment, Mrs Conway has a considerable overdraft at the bank. Now, there are two possible courses of action. One is to sell the houses for what they'll fetch and to hold on to the Farrow and Conway shares. But I warn you that the houses won't fetch much. The alternative is to sell the shares, then to raise an additional sum, probably between two or three thousand pounds, and to convert the houses into flats. We've had a sort of scheme from an architect and really it looks most attractive. There'd be at least 30 nice flats. And you know what people will pay for flats nowadays. Don't you think it a splendid idea, Ernest? Ernest? Well, I felt if we all discussed it in a nice, friendly way, we could decide something. I know you businessmen like everything cut and dried, but I believe it's better to be nice and friendly. It isn't true that people will only do things for money. I'm always being surprised about that. People are very nice and kind, really. Only last week I went to old Mrs Jepson's funeral and I was walking back through the cemetery with Mrs Whitehead. I hadn't been round there for years and I saw Carol's grave. And of course I was rather upset suddenly coming on it like that, but it was so beautifully kept with flowers, lovely flowers growing there. And I thought, now there's an instance. Nobody's told them to do that or paid them for it. It's just natural kindness. No, it isn't. Somebody must have been paying for it. Alan, it must be you. Uh, well, I, I do send them something once every year, you know. It isn't much. Oh, oh, Mother, I'd forgotten about Carol. It's 16 years ago. 17. Why, my Margaret's nearly as big as she was. But doesn't that seem strange, Kay? I'd nearly forgotten about Carol, too. Don't think I had, because I was so stupid about that grave. I'm not one of those people who remembers graves. It's human beings I remember. Only the other day, when I was sitting upstairs, I heard Carol shouting, Martha, Martha. Do you know how she used to? Yes. 
And then I began thinking about her, my poor darling, and how she came in that awful day, her face quite greyish, and said, Mother, I have the most sickening pain. And then it was too late when they operated. Yes, Mother, we remember. I'll tell you what you don't remember, and what some of you never even knew. Mm. She was the best of the lot, that one little Carol, worth all the rest of you put together. Ernest! Yes, and I'm counting you in. You were the one I wanted, that's all right. I got the one I wanted. But it didn't take me two hours to see that little Carol was the best of the lot. Didn't surprise me when she went off like that. Out. Finish. Too good to last. Ernest is quite right. She was the best of you all. My darling baby, I haven't forgotten you. I haven't forgotten you. Oh, why isn't Robin yet? Go on, Gerald, explaining it to the I shall belong. Don't move. <clears throat> Surely, under the circumstances, it's absurd that Mother and Alan should go on living in this house. It's much too large for them. Yes, uh, we could do with something much smaller now. Then this house could be sold. That would help. It's Mother's freehold, isn't it? I think it would be better to move into something smaller, just to cut down living expenses. But this house wouldn't fetch very much now. Why, Mother was offered thousands and thousands for it just after the war. Yes, but this isn't just after the war. It's just before the next war. Uh, how much do you think, Ernest? Take anything you can get for it. Well, <clears throat> what are we supposed to do? If the worst comes to the worst, we can club together to keep Mother going. It's monstrous. <sighs> when I was at home, knew about things. We were considered quite well off. There were all the shares and property father left, not simply for Mother, but for all of us. And now not only has it been nearly all frittered away, we're expected to provide for Mother. But if the money's gone, it's gone. Uh, no, the point is this. Hello. If... Oh, here, where's Mother? I uh, shall be back in a minute. Well, Joan, how are the offspring? They're quite well, Robin. Still telling them what an awful man their father is. Are we going to have this all over again? No, you're not. Dear old Madge. Do I see a drink over there? I do. Have a drink, Gerald. Ernest, have a drink. No? Well, I will. Hello, Kay. Condescending to visit the provinces again, eh? Yes, but I've got to be back sometime tonight. Don't blame you. Wish I was going back to town. That's the place. I've half a mind to chuck what I'm doing and try my luck there again. There are several decent chaps there. What are you doing now, Robin? <sighs> Trying to sell a new heavy motor oil. Ought to have tried your stunt writing. I might one day. I could tell them something. My oath, I could. Mm. Well, don't let me interrupt the business, Gerald. Or are you waiting for Mother? No, we're better without her. Yes, you would think that. But don't forget it's her money. Robin! Ah, oh, no, this is nice. Mm. Mm. Are you staying the night? I wasn't, but I could do. In Alan's best pyjamas. <laughs> you were just saying, Mother, that it was absurd for you to keep on living here. The house is much too big and expensive That's now. for Mother to decide. No, that's all right, dear. It is too big now. And, of course, if I sold it, I could probably raise enough to convert the church road houses into flats. No, you couldn't. Nothing like. Really, Ernest, I, I was offered £4,000 for it once. You ought to have taken it. I'm afraid you can't count on getting much for this house, though, of course, you'll save money by living in a smaller place. Hmm. No, not much, though. She'd have to pay rent for the smaller house, and this is hers. But rates and taxes are fairly heavy on this house. I want you all to understand that the present situation is very unsatisfactory. The overdraft can be paid off, of course, simply by selling shares or some of the houses, but after that, Mrs Conway would be worse off than ever. If the money for the conversion scheme could be raised, then the Church Road property would bring in a decent income. And I'm sure that's the thing to do. Flats. I might live in one of them myself. Nice, cosy little flat. Delightful. But after you've sold your shares, you've still to find another two or three thousand to pay for the conversion. But couldn't I borrow that? Not from the bank. They won't accept the Church Road houses as security for a loan to convert them into flats. I've tried that. Ernest could lend you the money. What? Well, you could easily afford it, Ernest. From what I hear, you're very well off indeed these days, Ernest. Oh, there's no doubt about that. And it only seems yesterday, Ernest, that you first came here, a very shy young man, from nowhere. That's just what I was, a shy young man from nowhere. When I managed to wangle myself into this house, I thought I'd got somewhere. I remember so well feeling that about you at the time, Ernest. Yes, I was made to feel I'd got somewhere too. But I stuck it. 
I've always been able to stick it when I've had my mind on something I badly wanted. That's how I've managed to get on. Don't begin to tell us now that you landed here with only a shilling in your pocket. No, no, Robin. I wasn't going to. Don't worry, you're not going to have the story of my life. All I was about to say was that as far as I'm concerned, you can whistle for your two or three thousand pounds. <laughs> you won't get a penny from me. And I might as well tell you, while I'm making myself unpleasant, that I could lend you the two or three thousand without feeling it. <laughs> Only I'm not going to. Not a penny. You make me feel ashamed. Oh, why? Go on. Tell them why I make you feel ashamed. Tell me. Or would you rather like to tell me later when I'm telling you a few things? I never did like you beavers. I've half a mind to boot you out of this house. You do and I'll bring an action for assault. And I'd enjoy it. My money or the boot, eh? I told Hazel a long time ago that not one of you would ever get a penny out of me. And I'm not mean. Ask her. But I swore to myself after the very first night I came here, when you were all being so high and mighty, <laughs> especially you, that you'd never see a penny that I ever made. I see. What's that mean? By God, she has. She's been giving you money. My money. Oh, Robin, why did you? What does it matter? He can't eat you. Come on, Hazel. Don't go if you don't want to. Hazel, there's nothing to be afraid of. There is. I'm frightened of him. Except right at the first, I've always been frightened of him. Don't be silly. This little pipsqueak, what can he do? I don't know. It isn't that. It's just something about him. Come on, I'm going. No. You sneaked your way in here, Ernest Beavers, and somehow you persuaded or bullied Hazel, who was considered then one of the prettiest girls in Newlingham, into marrying you. No, no, Mother, please don't. I'm going to tell him now what I've always wanted to tell him. I was a fool. My husband wouldn't have had such a bullying, mean little rat near the house. I never liked you, and I'm not surprised to hear you say you've always hated us. Don't ever come here again. Don't ever let me see you again. I only wish I was Hazel for just one day. I'd show you something. What? You, my daughter. No. Now, bring an action for that. You've done a lot of damn silly things in your time, Mrs. Conway, but you'll find that's the damn silliest. Come on, Hazel. Mother, you shouldn't. You'd be quite right. You just let me know if he gives you any trouble. Uh, no, Robin, you don't understand. You don't understand. I suppose that was a silly thing to do. I'm afraid it was, you know. You see, it's Hazel who will have to pay for it. Well, she needn't. She's only to let me know what he's up to. What's the good of talking like that? What could you do? He can make her life a misery and you couldn't stop it. I have no patience with her. I wouldn't stand it ten minutes. It's no use you talking, Madge. You simply don't understand. You've never been married. No, and after what I've seen here, I think I'm lucky. You're not lucky. Never were and never will be. And as you haven't the least idea what a woman's real life is like, the less you say, the better. You're not among schoolgirls and silly teachers now. Robin, give me a glass of port. Mm. Won't you have a drink too? I don't think there's any point in my staying any longer. Well, we haven't settled anything yet. I thought there was a chance that Ernest Beavers might have been persuaded to lend you the money, as I don't think anybody else here has £3,000 to spare. All right, Thornton, you needn't be so damn supercilious about it. Seems to me you've not made a particularly bright job of handling my mother's affairs. I don't think that comes too well from you. For years I've given good advice and never once has it been acted upon. Now I'd be only too delighted to hand over these affairs. I believe I could make a better job of it myself. I can't imagine a possible worse choice. Good night, Kay. Good night, Alan. I'll show you out. I think I'll come along too, Gerald. You'll be able to have a nice little chat about me on the way. It doesn't hurt so much as it used to do, Robin, when you say such bitter things. I suppose one day it won't hurt at all. Sorry, old girl. And give my love to the kids. See, I'm coming to see them soon. Yes, come and see us soon. Only remember, we're very poor now. <laughs> Thanks for that. And then you talk about being bitter. Good night, my dear. Oh, good night, Kay. It's been nice seeing you again. <laughs> hmm. Well, now we ought to be able to settle something. So far as I'm concerned, this has simply been a waste of time and nervous energy. You know, Madge, when I think of Gerald Thornton as he is now, a dreary, conceited, middle-aged bachelor, I can't help thinking it's perhaps a pity you didn't marry him. <laughs> what? 
Madge, I never knew you fancied Gerald Thornton. Mm, she did once, didn't you, dear? I believe he was interested. <laughs> oh, a long time ago, when you children were all still at home. Mother, if that's not true, then it's stupid, silly talk. If it is true, then it's cruel. Nonsense! And not so high and mighty, please, Kay. It was true. A long time ago, just after the war, when I still thought we could suddenly make everything better for everybody. Socialism, peace, universal brotherhood, all that. And I felt then that Gerald Thornton and I together could help. He had a lot of fine qualities, I thought, and only needed to be pulled out of his rut here to have his enthusiasm aroused. I was remembering tonight when I was looking at him. He came back to me very quickly. One evening, Mother. Just one evening. And something you did that evening ruined it all. I'd almost forgotten. But seeing us all here again tonight reminded me. I believe it was a sort of party for you, Kay. Do you remember, Mother? Really, Madge, you are absurd. I, I seem to remember some piece of nonsense when we were all being foolish. Yes, you remember. It was quite deliberate on your part. Uh, no. Just to keep a useful young man unattached or... Jealousy of a girl's possible happiness, or just out of sheer nasty female mischief. And something went forever. It can't have been worth very much, then. The seed is easily destroyed, but it might have grown into an oak tree. I'm glad I'm not a mother. Yes, you may well say that. I know how I'd have despised myself if I'd have turned out to be a bad mother. Oh, so that's what you call me? <sighs> just because you never think of anybody but yourselves, you're all selfish. Selfish! Because everything hasn't happened as you want it, you turn on me. All my fault. You never really think about me. You don't try to see things for a moment from my point of view. When you were children, I was so proud of you all, so confident that you would grow up to be wonderful creatures. I used to see myself at the age I am now, surrounded by you and your own children, so proud of you, so happy with you all. This house happier and gayer even than it was in the best of the old days. And now my life's gone by and what's happened? Madge, you're a resentful, soured schoolmistress, middle-aged before your time. <laughs> Hazel, the loveliest child there ever was, married to a vulgar little bully and terrified of him. And Kay here gone away to lead her own life and very bitter and secretive about it as if she'd failed. And then Carol, the happiest and kindest of you all, dead before she's twenty. Robin, I know, my dear, I'm not blaming you now, but I must speak the truth for once. With a wife he can't love, and no sort of position or comfort or anything. And Alan, the eldest, the boy his father adored that he thought might do anything. What's he now? Mother. A miserable clerk with no prospects, no ambition, no self-respect. A shabby little man that nobody would look at twice. Yes, a shabby clerk that nobody would look at twice. How dare you, Mother? How dare you? Alan, of all people! That's all right, Kay. Don't you get excited. It's not a bad description. I am a shabby little clerk, you know. It must be very disappointing. Oh, don't be so forgiving! Robin, you've always been selfish and weak and a bit of a good-for-nothing. Yeah, steady, old girl. I've had some rotten bad luck too, you know, and a lot of it's just luck. I've come to see that. All right. Add the bad luck too, my dear. The point is, whatever they may say about you, Robin, my darling, you're my own boy and my own sort and a great comfort. So you and I will go upstairs and talk. That's the spirit. <laughs> Mother, we've both said what we want to say. There isn't any more to be said. And if you decide to have any more of these family conferences, don't trouble to ask me to attend them, because I shan't. I don't expect now to see a penny of father's money, and please don't expect to see any of mine. Who wants yours? Come on, my dear. And we'll talk like human beings. <laughs> I have an idea I wasn't too pleasant to you, Kay, earlier, when we met tonight. If so, I'm sorry. That's all right, Madge. Are you going back to Collingfield tonight? No, I can't, but I'm staying with Nora Fleming. You remember her? She's mm. head of Newlingham High now. I've left my things there. I'll go now. I don't want to see Mother again. Goodbye, Madge. 
I hope you collar one of these headships. Goodbye, Kay. Do try to write a good book instead of doing nothing but this useless journalism. We'll leave you now. Come on, Alan. Yes. Good half hour yet, Kay, before you need to set out for the London train. I'll take you to the station. Oh, what's the matter? Has all this been a bit too much for you? <laughs> Apparently. Hmm. I thought I was tough now, Alan. See, I was doing the modern working woman. A cigarette and a whiskey and soda. <laughs> no good, though. You see, Alan, I've not only been here tonight... I've been here remembering other nights, long ago, when we weren't like this. Yes, I know. All those old Christmases and birthday parties. Yes, I remembered. I saw all of us then. Myself, too. Oh, silly girl of 1919. Oh. Lucky girl. <laughs> you mustn't mind too much, you know. It's all right. You like being 40? Oh, no. <laughs> Alan, it's hideous and unbearable. Remember what we once were and what we thought we'd be? And now this. And it's all we have, Alan. It's us. Every step we've taken, every tick of the clock, making everything worse. If this is all life is, what's the use? Better to die like Carol before you find it out, before time gets to work on you. I've felt it before, Alan. But never as I've done tonight. There's a great devil in the universe. And we call it time. What, did you ever read Blake? Yes. What, do you remember this? Uh, joy... And woe were woven fine, a clothing for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine runs a joy with silk and twine. <sighs> it is right it should be so. Man was made for joy and woe. And when this we rightly know, safely through the world we go. <sighs> safely through the world we go. Mm. No, it isn't true, Alan. Or it isn't true for me. If things were merely mixed, good and bad, that would be all right. But they get worse. We've seen it tonight. Time's beating us. Uh, no, time's only a kind of dream, Kay. If it wasn't, it would have to destroy everything, the whole universe, and then remake it again every tenth of a second. But time doesn't destroy anything. It merely moves us on in this life from one peephole to the next. <laughs> but the happy young Conways who used to play charades here, they've gone and gone forever. No, they're real. They're real and existing, just as we two here now are real and existing. We're seeing another bit of the view, a bad bit, if you like, but the whole landscape's still there. But, Alan, we can't be anything but what we are now. No. It's, uh, it's hard to explain suddenly like this. There's a book I'll lend you. Read it on the train. But the point is, now, at this moment, or any moment, we're only a cross-section of our real selves. What we really are is the whole stretch of ourselves, all our time. And when we come to the end of this life, all those selves, all our time, will be us, the real you, the real me. And then perhaps we'll find ourselves in another time, which is only another kind of dream. Well, I'll try to understand. 
So long as you really believe, and think it's possible for me to believe, that time's not ticking our lives away, wrecking and ruining everything forever. No, it's all right, Kay. I'll get you the book. You know, I believe half our trouble is because we think time's ticking our lives away. That's why we snatch and grab and hurt each other. As if we were all in a panic on a sinking ship. Yes, yes, like that. But you don't do those things. Bless you. Well, I think it's easier not to. You know, if you take a long view. As if we're immortal beings. Yes. And in for a tremendous adventure. Kay is sitting just as we left her in 1919. Alan enters and switches on the lights. The room and everything in it is exactly as they were before. Only Kay herself has changed. Something elusive, a brief vision, a score of shadowy presentiment is haunting her. She is deeply disturbed. She throws a look or two at the room, as if she had just seen it in some other guise. She looks at Alan, puzzled. He grins and rubs his hands a little. Well, Kay? Alan? Yes? No, no uh, nothing. Well, I believe you've been asleep. While Mother was singing. No, I was sitting here, listening. I turned the light out. No, I didn't fall asleep. I, I don't know. Perhaps I did. Just for a second. It couldn't have been longer. Well, you'd know if you'd been asleep. No, I... I wasn't asleep. But... Quite suddenly, I... I thought I saw... Well, we were... Well, anyhow, you came into it, I think, Alan. Came into what? Oh, I can't remember. And I know I was listening to Mother singing all the time. I'm a, I'm a bit wuzzy. Well, most of the people are going now. You'd better go and say goodnight. Oh, Hazel, you greedy pig! Mmm, mm, cake! Mmm, no. <laughs> I didn't come in here just to eat this. No, of course you did. No, they're all saying goodnight now, and I'm dodging that little horror Gerald Thornton brought. Oh, I must say my piece to them. Mm. Hazel? Mm? -hmm. What's Joan Helford going to do now? Oh, just mooch around a bit. Well, I thought I heard her saying she was going away. I was wondering if she was leaving Newlingham. Oh, she's only going to stay with her aunt. Joan's always staying with aunts. Why can't we have aunts planted all over the place? Well, there's Aunt Edith. And a doctor's house in Wolverhampton. Oh, ghastly. Anything else you'd like to know about Joan, Alan? No, no, I, I was just wondering. Mm. Oh, uh, Mr Beavers, you going? In a minute. Yes, well... Oh, Alan, you're not going. Uh, yes, have to say goodnight and get their coats and things, you know. I just looked in to say goodnight, Miss Conway. Oh, yes, of course. It's been a great pleasure to me to come here and meet you all. Oh, well... Especially you. I'm new round here, you know. I've only been in the place about three months. I bought a share in that paper mill, Eckersley's, out at West Newlingham. You know it? No. I thought you might have noticed it. Been there long enough. Matter of fact, it wants rebuilding. But that's where I am. 
And I hadn't been here a week before I noticed you, Miss Conway. Did you? Yes, and I've been watching out for you ever since. I expect you've noticed me knocking about. No, I don't think I have. Oh, yes, you must have done. Come on now, admit it. Well, if you must know, I have noticed you. I thought so. Because I thought you behaved very stupidly and rudely. If you want to look silly yourself, that's your affair, but you've no right to make me look silly too. Oh, I didn't know it had been as bad as that. Well, it has. I'm sorry. Well, I can't see anybody's much the worse for it. After all, we've only one life to live. Let's get on with it, I say. And in my opinion, you're the best-looking girl in this town, Miss Hazel Conway. I've been telling you that in my mind for the last two months. But I knew it wouldn't be long before I got to know you. To tell you properly. I expect you're thinking I'm not much of a chap. But there's a bit more in me than meets the eye. A few people have found that out already. And a lot more will find it out before long. Here in Newlingham, you'll see. Would it be all right if I uh, sort of called to see you sometime soon? Uh, you'd better ask my mother. Oh, sort of ask Mama business, eh? Well, no, I didn't mean it like that at all. I, I meant that this is Mother's house. But you're old enough now to have friends of your own, aren't you? I don't make friends with people very quickly. Oh, I heard you did. Do you mean to say you've been discussing me with people? Yes. Why not? We weren't in uniform, you know. I did some stoking. Hard work, but a great stunt. It wasn't. You ought to have been ashamed of yourselves. Why? Because helping to break a strike and being a blackleg isn't a lark and a stunt. Those railway men were desperately anxious to improve their conditions. They didn't go on strike for fun. It was a very serious thing for them and for their wives and families. And then people like you, Robin, think it's amusing when you try to do their work and make the strike useless. I think it's shameful the way the middle classes turn against the working class. But there had to be some sort of train service. Why? If the public had to do without trains altogether, they might realise then that the railway men have some grievances. They might, but have an idea they'd be too busy with their own grievance, no trains. And you only want a few more railway strikes, and then half their traffic will be gone forever, turned into road transport. And what do your clever railway men do then? And another thing, the working class is out for itself. Why shouldn't the middle class be out for itself? Because the middle class must have already been out for itself, as you call it. Well, what do you call it? Something in Latin? I say the middle class must have already been successfully out for itself, or it wouldn't be a comfortable middle class. And why turn against the working class when at last it tries to look after itself? That's easy. There's only so much to go around, and if you take more, I get less. I'm sorry, but that's bad economics as well as bad ethics. But we'd have Red Revolution, like Russia, if we began to listen to these wild chaps like this J.H. Thomas. Well, I think it's all silly. Why can't people agree? Uh, Miss Conway? Oh, yes. Good night. I came in here for something. What was it? Don't ask me. Were you in the army? Yes, two years. What crush? Army pay corps. That must have been fun for you. Excuse me. Hmm. Mr Beavers! Hmm. Oh, you look put out. That's about it, put out. I believe you're all hot and angry inside, aren't you? Or disappointed. Which is it? A mixture, I expect. Well, Mr Beavers, you mustn't. You were very nice about the charade and very good in it, too. And I don't suppose you've ever played before, have you? No. They didn't go in for those sort of things in my family. No. I don't think you've had enough fun. That's your trouble, Mr Beavers. You must come and play charades again. <laughs> you're all right, you know. Surely he's gone, hasn't he? We're all all right, you know. And don't forget that, Mr Beavers. You're a funny kid. I'm not very funny, and I'm certainly not a kid. Oh, sorry. I'll forgive you this time. Yeah, I'm just going, Mrs Conway. You coming along, Gerald? No, Mr Thornton and I want to talk business for a few minutes. I see. Well, good night, Mrs Conway. And I'm very pleased to have met you. Good night, Mr Beavers. Carol, will you show? Yes. I'll set you in your house on the big trail, partner. <laughs> I'm sorry if your little friend thought he was being pushed out, but really, Gerald, the children would never have forgiven me if I'd encouraged him to stay any longer. I'm afraid Beavers hasn't been a success. Well, after all, he's rather... <laughs> isn't he? <laughs> I, I did warn you, you know. 
And really, he was so desperately keen to meet the famous Conways. Hazel, you mean? Well, Hazel, especially. But he was determined to know the whole family. Well, I do think they're an attractive lot of children. Only outshone by their attractive mother. Gerald, <laughs> I believe you're going to flirt with me. Of course I am. <laughs> uh, by the way, there wasn't any business you wanted to discuss, was there? No, not really. But I think you ought to know I've had another enormous offer for this house. Of course, I wouldn't dream of selling it, but it's nice to know it's worth so much. Mm. Oh, and young George Farrow would like me to sell him my share in the firm and says he's ready to make an offer that would surprise me. Well, I believe it would be pretty handsome, too. But, of course, there's no point in selling out when they're paying 15%. And once we're really out of this wartime atmosphere and the government restrictions are off, there's going to be a tremendous boom. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? <laughs> All the children back home mm. and plenty of money to help them to settle down and... Mind you, Gerald, I shouldn't be a bit surprised if Robin doesn't do awfully well in some business quite soon. Selling things, probably. <laughs> People find him so attractive. Dear Robin. Gerald, it isn't so very long ago that I thought myself the unluckiest woman in the world. If it hadn't been for the children, I wouldn't have wanted to go on living. Sometimes, without him, I didn't want to go on living. And now, though of course I'll never be the same without him, I certainly feel I'm one of the luckiest women in the world. All my children round me, quite safe at last, very happy. Titan seek all over the house. Did he say all over the house? <laughs> yes. Not in my room, Robin, please. <laughs> Mother's room's barred. Who's going to be it? I am. Mother, come on, where's Gerald? Oh. Just to hear him shouting about the house again, you don't know what it means to me, Gerald. And you never will know. I'll go into the coat cupboard and count 50. <laughs> now then, scatter! <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Especially, I saw you come in. Oh, no, please, go somewhere else. Oh, you look so pretty, Joan. Oh, do I? That's sweet of you, Alan. Oh, can I stay then? No, 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 please, it's so much more fun if you go somewhere else. Alan, don't spoil it. Spoil what? The game, of course. But go on, Alan, there's a pet. Oh. oh, no, 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 you can't go that way. You'll have to go out of the window and then round. Go on. Oh, quickly, all right. Quickly, quickly. Goodbye, Joan. Why do you say that? Well, because I feel it is goodbye. Don't help you can't escape. No, 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 no escape, little Joan, no escape. Oh, Robin. Oh, Joan. Oh, I suppose you've been doing this to dozens of girls. Yes, Joan, dozens. I thought so. Like that, Joan. But not like this. Oh, Robin, you are sweet. Oh. You know, Jad, although it's not so very long since I saw you last, I couldn't believe my eyes tonight. You look so stunning. It was because I just heard that you'd come back, Robin. I don't believe it. Yes, it's true. Honestly, I don't suppose you ever thought about me, have you? Yes, I have. Hundreds of times. Oh, I've thought about you too. Oh, oh. oh Jan, you are a darling. Remember that morning you went away so early? A year ago. 
Yes, but you weren't there, only Mother and Hazel and Kay. No, I was there too, but I didn't let any of you see me. You got up at that filthy hour just to see me go? Yes, of course. Oh, it was awful, trying to hide and trying not to cry all at the same time. Joan, I'd no idea. I didn't mean to give myself away. Oh, but Joan! Oh, oh gosh, it's marvellous. You don't love me? Of course I do. Golly, this is great. Joan, we'll, we'll have a scrumptious time. Yes, let's. But, Robin, it's terribly serious, you know. Oh, yes. Don't think I don't feel that, too. That's no reason why we shouldn't enjoy ourselves, is it? No, no, no. <laughs> let's be happy forever and ever. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. They're in here. Courting. I knew there was a catch to this hide and seek. <laughs> Sorry. Shall we start again? You two had better explain to Mother. I'm going to make tea. <laughs> Come on, Joan. Yes. Well, Madge, it sounds all right. And I know Lord Robert Cecil's a fine chap. But I don't quite see where I come into it. Because in a few weeks' time, there'll be a branch of this League of Nations Union here in Newlingham. It's no use my doing much about it, though I'll join, of course, because I'll be away. But you could be organising secretary or something, Gerald. Don't know that I'd be much good. You'd be perfect. You understand business. You know how to handle people. You'd make a good public speaker. Oh. Gerald, you're maddening. Why, Madge, what have I done now? We're friends, aren't we? I consider you one of my very best friends, Madge. And I hope I'm not flattering myself. Of course not. Good. So? You're not doing enough, Gerald. Oh, I'm kept pretty busy, you know. Yes, I don't mean you're lazy. Though I'm not sure that you aren't a bit, you know, Gerald. I mean, you're not doing enough with yourself. You're not using yourself to the utmost. I could be tremendously proud of you, Gerald. That's almost overwhelming, coming from you, Madge. Why from me? Because I know very well that you've got a very good brain and are a most critical young woman. Rather frightening. <laughs> Nonsense. You don't mean that. I, I'd much rather you didn't, you know. All right, I don't. As a matter of fact, I'm very fond of you, Madge, but don't often get a chance of showing you that I am. I've always been fond of you, Gerald. And that's why I say I could be tremendously proud of you. We're going to build up a new world now. This horrible war was probably necessary because it was a great bonfire in which we threw all the old, nasty rubbish of the world. Civilization can really begin. At last, people have learned their lesson. Mm, I hope so. Oh, Gerald, don't be so pessimistic, so cynical. Sorry, but a lawyer, even a young one, sees a lot of human nature in his office. There's a procession of people with their quarrels and grievances, and sometimes I wonder how much people are capable of learning. That's because you have to deal with some of the stupidest. But the people all over the world have learned their lesson. You'll see, no more piling up armaments, no more wars, no more hate and intolerance and violence. Oh, Gerald, I believe that when we look back in 20 years' time, we'll be staggered at the progress that's been made, because things happen quickly now. Well, that's true enough. And so is all the rest. Under the League, we'll build up a new commonwealth of all the nations, so they can live in peace forever, and imperialism will go. And so in the end, of course, will capitalism. There'll be no more booms and slumps and panics and strikes and lockouts, because the people themselves, led by the best brains in their countries, will possess both the political and economic power. There'll be socialism at last, a free, prosperous, happy people, all enjoying equal opportunities, living at peace with the whole world. <laughs> Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O oh, clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Oh, Madge, you're inspired tonight. I I hardly recognise you. You're... Oh, this is the real me. <laughs> Gerald, in this new world we're going to build up now, men and women won't play silly little games of cross-purposes any longer. They'll go forward together, sharing everything. <laughs> oh, Madge, dear, your hair's all over the place. You've made your nose all shiny. You're horribly untidy. And I'm sure you're in the middle of a socialist speech that must be boring poor Gerald. <clears throat> poor Madge. Mother. What? 
Hazel. You know. I think I- I'd better be going. Oh, no, Gerald, don't go. Kay and Carol are making some tea and we're all going to be nice and cosy together in here. I fancy it's rather late, though. After 11, I must go. I have an early appointment in the morning and one or two things to look through before I turn in tonight, so... Oh, are you off, Gerald? Uh, good night, Kay. Thank you for a very nice party and now that you're properly grown up, I hope you'll be happy. <laughs> Thank you, Gerald. Do you think I will? I don't know, Kay. I really don't know. Oh, no, I'll see you out, Gerald. Um, I've always thought it must be much more fun being a girl than being a man. I'm never sure. Sometimes men seem quite hopelessly dull, like creatures made out of wood. And then at other times they seem to have all the fun. Okay, just now, this very minute, I wish I wasn't a girl. I'd like to be a man, one of those men with red faces and loud voices who just don't care what anybody says about them. <laughs> well, perhaps they do, though. Well, I'd like to be one of those who don't. Why all this? Alan says he wants to go to bed. Oh, no, Alan, don't spoil it. Oh, how could I? By going to bed. It's my birthday and you're not to leave us until I say you can. Mm. Quite right, Kay. And that's because we're very, very fond of you, Alan. No. Though you are such a chump. You must smoke your pipe, too, for coziness. Robin and Joan are courting in the dining room now. I can see they're going to be an awful nuisance. If you had to fall in love with somebody, would you like it to be at home or somewhere else? Oh, somewhere else. Too ordinary at home. On a yacht or the terrace at Monte Carlo or a Pacific island. Oh, marvellous. That would be using up too many things at once. Greedy stuff. I am greedy. Oh, I should think so. Yesterday morning she was in the bath reading Green Mantle and <laughs> eating nut milk chocolate. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be too ordinary, falling in love at home here. It would be best, I think. Suppose you were suddenly unhappy. It would be awful to be desperately unhappy and in love miles away in a strange house. <sighs> Kay? What's the matter? Nothing. Then it must have been a goose walking over your grave. Now then, let's have some tea and be nice and cosy together. Where's Robin? Spooning with Joan in the dining room. Oh, hasn't Joan gone yet? I really think she might leave us to ourselves now. After all, it's the first time we've all been together in this house for... How long? It must be at least three years. I'll pour out. Come on, Kay, what's the matter? Shh, it's a mood. That's better, darling. What a funny child you are, aren't you? Not really, Mother. Where's Madge? She went upstairs. Go up, Alan, and tell her we're all in here with some tea and ask her very nicely, dear, especially from me to come down. Mm. I'll bet she doesn't. This is just like old times, isn't it? And we seem to have waited so long. I ought to tell fortunes again. Oh, yes, Mother, do. No. Okay. Really? Have you had too much excitement today? No, I don't think so. Sorry, Mother. Somehow, I hated the idea of you messing about with those cards tonight. I never did like it much. I believe only the bad things come true. Certainly not. I clearly saw Madge's Girton scholarship, remember? I said she was going to get one, didn't I? And I always said Robin and Alan would come back. I saw it every time in the cards. I, I, I think I ought to go now, Mrs Conway. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Kay. It's been the loveliest party there ever was. I really have had a marvellous time, Mrs Conway. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mother? Are you two children serious? Of course we are. Joan? Yes. Then I think you'd better have a cup of tea, hadn't you? Oh, I'm so happy! <laughs> tea, tea, tea. <laughs> Madge says she's too tired, Mother. Oh, well, I think we can get on very nicely without Madge. Kay ought to read us some of the new novels she's writing. I couldn't possibly, Mother. I can't see why not. You always expect me to be ready to sing for you. That's different. Kay's always so solemn and secretive about her writing, as if she were ashamed of it. I am, in a way. I know it's not good enough yet. Most of it's stupid. Stupid, stupid. It isn't, Kay. Yes, it is, Angel. But it won't always be. It must come right if I only keep on trying, and then... 
You'll see. Is that what you want to do, Kay? Just to write novels and things? Yes. But there's nothing in simply writing. The point is to be good, to be sensitive and sincere. Mm. Hardly anybody's both, especially women who write. But I'm going to try and be. And whatever happens, I'm never, never going to write except what I want to write. What I feel is true to me, deep down. I won't write just to please silly people or just to make money. I'll... Go on, Kay. No, Alan, I... I'd finished, really. Or if I was going to say something else, I'd forgotten what it was. Nothing much. You're sure you're not overtired, Kay? No, Mother, really. I wonder what will have happened to you, Hazel, when Kay's a famous novelist. Perhaps one of your majors and captains will come back for you soon. Oh, they needn't. In fact, I'd rather none of them did. <laughs> Thinks you can do much better than them. <laughs> <laughs> I know I can, Robin. I shall marry a tall, rather good-looking man about five or six years older than I am, and he'll have plenty of money and be very fond of travel, and we'll go all over the world together but have a house in London. <laughs> what about Paul Newlingham? Um, Mother, I couldn't possibly spend the rest of my life here. I'd die. But you shall have to come and stay with us in London <laughs> and we'll give parties so that people can come and stare at my sister, Kay Conway, the famous <laughs> novelist. <laughs> what about your brother, Robin, the famous... Oh, famous something or other, you bet your life. You don't know what you're going to do yet, Robin. Well, give me a chance. I've only been out of the Air Force about 12 hours. But by jingo, I'm going to do something. And uh, none of this starting at the bottom of the ladder, pushing a pen in the corner business either. This is a time when young men get a chance, and I'm going to take it. You watch. Don't tell me you're going to run away from Newlingham, too. Oh, well, I don't know about that yet, Mother. I might make a start here. There's some money in the place, thanks to some jolly rotten profiteering, and we're pretty well known here, so that would help. But I don't guarantee to take root in Newlingham, no fear. So don't be surprised, Hazel, if I'm in London before you. Or even before you, Kay. Making plenty of money. Perhaps more than this tall, good-looking chap of yours will be making. <laughs> Hazel will always have plenty of money. <laughs> How do you know, Carol? I just do. It came over me suddenly, then. Well, now, I thought I was the prophetic one of the family. <laughs> I suppose it wouldn't be fair if I sent my rival to bed. I should jolly well think it wouldn't. And I'll tell you another thing. Alan's the happy one. Good old Alan. Well, I, I rather think you're wrong there, you know, Carol. I'm not. I know. Now, I'm not going to have this. I'm the one who knows in this family. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Yes. I see Robin dashing about making lots of money and becoming very important <laughs> and helping some of you others and a very devoted young wife by his side. <laughs> and Hazel, of course, being very grand. And her husband is tall and quite good-looking. Nearly as good-looking as she thinks he is. I believe he comes into a title. Snob. <laughs> I don't see Madge marrying. But then she'll be headmistress of a big school quite soon. And then she'll become one of these women who are on all sorts of committees and have to go up to London to give evidence and so becomes happy and grand that way. I bet she will too. Good old Madge. Yes. I'll go and stay with her sometimes. Very important, the headmistress's mother. And the other mistresses will be invited in to dine and will listen very respectfully while I tell them about my other children. Oh, Mrs Conway, <laughs> I can just imagine that. You'll have a marvellous time. And then there's Carol. Well, of course, Carol will be here with me for years yet. Oh, I don't know about that. I haven't exactly decided what to do yet. There are so many things to do. Oh, Carol, I think you could go on the stage. <laughs> oh, yes, I could, of course, and I've often thought of it. But I shouldn't want to be on the stage all the time. And when I wasn't playing a part, I'd like to be painting pictures. Just for myself, you know, daubing like mad, with lots and lots of the very brightest paint. Tubes and tubes of vermilion, <laughs> and royal blue and emerald green and gamboge and <laughs> cobalt and Chinese white. And then making all kinds of weird dresses for myself. <laughs> and scarlet cloaks and black crepe de chine gowns with orange dragons all over them. <laughs> and cooking! Cook. Yes! <laughs> Doing sausages and gingerbread and pancakes and sitting on top of mountains and going down rivers in canoes and making friends with all sorts of people. And I'll share a flat or a little house with Kay in London. And Alan would come and stay with us and smoke his pipe. <laughs> and we'd talk about books and laugh at ridiculous people and then go to foreign countries. Why, I stay. <laughs> well, how are you going to begin doing all that, you ridiculous child? <laughs> Get it all in somehow. The point is to live. Never mind about money and positions and husbands with titles and rubbish. 
I'm going to live. All right, darling. <laughs> but wherever you were, all of you, and whatever you were doing, you'd all come back here sometimes, wouldn't you? I'd come and see you, but you'd all come and see me too, all together. Perhaps with wives and husbands and lovely children of your own. <laughs> Not being rich and famous or anything, but just being yourselves, as you are now. Enjoying our silly old jokes. Sometimes playing the same silly old games. <laughs> all one big happy family. I can see us all here again. No, don't! <laughs> but what is it, Kay? <laughs> I, I won't bother with any of those things, Kay. Really, I won't. <laughs> I'll come and look after you wherever you go. I won't leave you ever if you don't want me to. I'll look after you, darling. Really, Kay, what's the matter? Alan, please tell me. I can't bear it. And there's something, something you could tell me. I'm sorry, Kay. I don't understand. What is it? Something you know that would make it different. Not so hard to bear. Don't you know yet? Oh, no, I, I don't understand. Oh, hurry. Hurry, Alan. And then tell me and comfort me. Something of Blake's came into it. <sighs> Joy and woe are woven fine. A clothing for the soul divine. Oh, I used to know that verse too. Oh, what was it at the end? And when this we rightly know, safely through the world we go. Safely through the world we go. <sighs> Over excitement. I might have known. Kay, darling, all this birthday excitement's been too much. You'd better go to bed now, dear. And Carol shall bring you some hot milk, perhaps an aspirin too, eh? You're all right now, aren't you, darling? Yes, Mother. I'm, I'm all right. I know what might help. It did once before. Robin, come mm. with me. I ought to go, oughtn't I? No. Stay a few minutes, Joan. Oh. Robin? She's going to sing. And I know what it'll be. something I can tell you one day. I'll try. I promise. In Time and the Conways by J.B. Priestley, Mrs. Conway was played by Harriet Walter, Kay by Anna Maidley, Alan by Rupert Evans, Carol by Amaka Okafor, Hazel by Eleanor Howell, Robin by Harry Haddon Payton, and Madge by Heather Craney. Joan was played by Claire Corbett, Ernest by Tony Bell, Gerald by Clive Haywood, and J.B. Priestley by Michael Burtonshaw. The pianist was Colin Guthrie, and the director was David Hunter. <laughs>